So the panel is called Vegans in Politics and Leadership. Vegans in Leadership and Politics is based on um, Kathy Devine's book, Golden Age Politics, Inspired Ethical Politics for a Peaceful, Thriving World. Kathy Devine will be hosting this panel. She will be remotely streaming on the screens in front of you. Um, all of our panelists will be able to see you um, with the cameras. Uh, so make sure that you're smiling. Not that they can see that. <laughs> um, but Kathy is the author of six vegan-themed books and the founder and editor of Australian Vegans Journal, an independent print and digital vegan magazine. Kathy's passionate about creating a kinder world for all beings and assisting people to reach their full, powerful potential. So I will throw you over to Kathy Devine, and she will introduce you to our lovely panel today. Please enjoy. Acknowledging the traditional owners of the land we meet on today, the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains, and pay my respect to elders past, present, and emerging. I would also act like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the Wiradjuri people of the Riverina region, where I'm broadcasting from today. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, that these lands were never ceded and it always was, always will be Aboriginal land. So welcome to Vegans in Politics and Leadership Panel at the Vegan Festival Adelaide 2021. Huge, huge thanks to Lee McBride for inviting me to uh, hold this panel today. And I think it's fair to say that all of us here today want to live in a peaceful, thriving world and want our animal co-inhabitants to enjoy their lives and live in peace and freedom too. There are many of us that are concerned for the world we find ourselves in. How can the world recover from its current environmental, social and economic issues? And how can we tackle these issues? And who is going to lead us there? In my book, Golden Age Politics, Inspired Ethical Politics for a Peaceful, Thriving World, I explored these questions. I asked my readers um, what they would like leadership to look like. And in short, I suggested that we need to focus on ethical leadership. The leadership on this planet needs to change and fast. Golden Age politics illustrates that by re uh, reorganizing politics, that we can reignite, re-inspire and re-engage even the weariest of change makers, not just in the political um, arena, but in every area in society to create ethical leadership everywhere. In addition to my book, Golden Age Politics, I'm in the middle of developing an online program focused on ethical leadership. It will outline how to prepare to be a leader who is beneficial to this world. Some of the core principles of this program are the number one most important one, the absolute importance of living vegan as the foundation of ethical leadership in all places where leaders can be found. Set number two is to purify your intentions before you take up leadership positions because we have no time or place for corruption or greed. Number three is strengthen your resolve. So adopting and strengthening a never give up mindset is essential for effective leadership in the long term as is self-care throughout the journey. And the last one is tame your ego. Big egos burn themselves out eventually and make terrible decisions in the process. We must lead with humility, compassion and wisdom or not at all. This is just a sample uh, from my upcoming leadership program. It will provide support to people who are sincere in making a positive difference in the world uh, please feel free to reach out to me on social media or by email for more information or to join the waitlist for that. Um, for the sake of the next generation, we need to create just and ethical frameworks for future generations to build on and maintain. And ethical leadership just starts on an individual level first, so then in turn you can become the leaders the world most urgently needs right now. So on today's panel, we have three vegan leaders who are actively advocating for animals in politics. I'd like to welcome our panelists today and thank them in advance for what will no doubt be an insightful and inspiring discussion. 
Firstly, um, I'd like to welk welcome Andy Maddock. Andy is the Animal Justice Party's Member for Parliament in Victoria. Elected to Victorian Parliament in 2018, he represents the Western Victoria region and is the first politician elected in Victoria on an animal protection platform. Amazing. Andy has been a dedicated animal rights campaigner for many years for issues such as duck shooting, jumps racing, live exports and animal circuses to name a few. He lives on Victoria's surf coast with his wife April, their two children, rescue greyhound, rescue shih tzu and three cats. I'm also privileged to welcome Georgie Purcell, who's Andy's Chief of Staff. In addition, Georgie is the President of Oscars Law, Australia's most recognisable anti-puppy uh, farming organisation. Georgie has a Bachelor of Laws, a Bachelor of Communications and Public Relations degree and has worked in the union movement. Georgie also writes for the Kindness Project and runs a small animal sanctuary with her partner in Victoria's Macedon Ranges. Finally, I want to welcome Animal Justice Party candidate Louise Pfeiffer, who ran in the South Australia election in 2018. Uh, Louise has a passion for data and is part of Voices for Animals, an online media group dedicated to sharing information about animal abuse issues. Her published work has extensively explored issues which include duck shooting, bow, uh, bow hunting, jumps racing, greyhound racing, factory farming and live export trade. Assisting me today in Adelaide is Christy Alga, who is the author of Five Essays of Freedom, a political primer for animal advocates. You can also find her writing on medium.com under the writing liberation handle. Welcome everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting setup, but um, it's, it's, it's amazing. And we really thank the festival for, for allowing us to do this blended panel today. So yeah, let's get started. Um, we were gonna be, we're gonna start by asking the panel each um, three questions, and then we'll take it from there. Audience participation is really encouraged. So if you have a question, um, after we've done this initial round of questions, please jump in and be part of this interactive chat. Okay, so I'll start with Andy um, as our politician here. So the first question is, not all vegans and animal rights campaigners enter politics, though some do. What would be your advice for someone who is considering entering politics or some kind of leadership position? Uh, look, I would absolutely encourage any vegan possible to enter politics um, from the traditional perspective. Um, I think um, I, I take the view that all activism, regardless whether it's animal activism or whether it's social um, social justice activism, is already a political struggle. It's already an expression of, of politics um, out in the world. And to enter, the, it's it's not um, a, a big jump actually to make that shift into what we would term traditional politics, because you know you can. Be involved in a social justice movement you can be involved in an animal rights movement and have wins you know you can be a member of an ngo like like georgie as president of oscar's law you know they were instrumental in getting the puppy farm legislation through in victoria um you know if, if not for their advocacy that would never have happened and that was political advocacy because we have to recognize that to institute change we have to change someone's mindset and often often we have to change what is currently a law and usually a bad law um, and, and so politics and particularly politics for animals needs more people moving into that sphere of the legislative sphere of political activism um, because the more representatives that we have the more wins we get because you know the more seriously the issues that we represent are taken within the halls of power and therefore a, a greater light is shone on them and it gives us the opportunity to show where legislation has affected them so badly, where they've been let down by legislation and gives us the opportunity to change that law. And the more voices we have in that sphere, the better for that. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, just the second one. From, I, I listened to your main stage talk yesterday. It was amazing. Um, it's very clear that you've achieved a long list of successes for animals since being elected into parliament. Um, you also mentioned the importance of building relationships with your fellow members of parliament and mentioned your concept of, um, I think it was collaborative politics. Mm. 
you um, you were voted into Parliament um, based on the work you plan to do for animals. But as a member of Parliament, you have the opportunity to vote on all bills, and you'll so, you'll soon um, be able to vote on the public health and um, well-being amendment. Uh, um, I acknowledge that you and your staff have received a lot of feedback about your plan to support the bill, and some of this feedback has been of an abusive nature. It's really sad to hear. Um, there's also been the QCs who have written their opinion piece in the Age newspaper who have expressed some concern about the nature and extent of the powers that this bill gives the Premier and the Victorian Government. Um, I've, I've, not, I've just, everyone's. Um, you know, I've been looking on your social media and seen a lot of comments there and people are begging you to explain why you've decided to back this bill, um, given the widespread concerns from many corners. I'd just like to like, give you the opportunity to speak briefly on that here um, to perhaps give some clarity and assurance to, to your voters. Sure. Look, no one would have wanted ever, I don't think anyone would have wanted to enter Parliament and knowing that we were about to go through a, a pandemic that was going to affect so many people worldwide. And indeed, it's actually killed over 5 million people already around the world. Um, to enter that sphere um, knowingly, um, I, I don't think anyone would do that. Um, so we've been thrust into a situation that no one would have thought we'd have to deal with. Now, when we look at Victoria in isolation to other states, um, the only way that any of us, any state could deal with the situation that we're in is through state of emergency laws, okay? And they're really not fit for purpose for a pandemic, but it's the only legislative framework that any of us could deal with it on. Now, in Victoria, we are the only state in Australia that has to have the, uh, an extension to state of emergency laws returned to the parliament to vote on. In every other state, they are enacted and they are unending until the, the, the official, whoever that might be in that state who has control of that state of emergency, deems it that it can be rescinded, okay? So that's the difference in Victoria. It's already a democratic process to extend the state of emergency. However, it was recognised that a state of emergency was a bad legislative fit for this type of emergency. And if we look at the fact that, you know, once this pandemic is dealt with, we might not see another one for a long time, but we would need legislation that could specifically deal with the types of things that we've had to go through during this one. So that was the reason behind the framing of pandemic specific legislation. So I've been working closely with the government on the things that I would like to see in there. And it's a public document as it stands now. So I don't mind saying some of the things that we advocated for through my team. And one of those things is this independent panel of experts who are made up of lawyers, who is made up of human rights experts, um, health experts, everyone who will give advice to the government on whether they think any of the measures that might be instigated under a future pandemic or even towards the end of this one, whether they think they're right, whether they should go ahead, whether they should be suspended or even revoked. And the other thing that's a key aspect of this particular legislation is as well, it does have a revoke principle in it. So it can be revoked. Now, it's, so it's not unending. Okay, it, it's not permanent pandemic legislation. And I wanna make that very clear, it's not permanent. It can be revoked. The other thing that we were keen on setting up and we know we've got it is that the, the SARC Committee of Parliament, which is short for Scrutiny of Acts and Regulations Committee, they have oversight over every single measure of this bill too. And every single measure that's instituted, every restriction, they have the right to recommend to Parliament and to take to the chambers of both houses of Parliament to vote to either suspend or revoke any particular measure or restriction. Now that's 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 oversight, okay? And some of the criticisms that have been of the government up until this point is that the health advice, you know, and, and the reasons behind certain measures being instig instigated have not been tabled or have not been made public. They will be, and they have to, in this bill, they have to be made public either in six days or 14 days, okay? Depending on where it sits in the cycle. So all of those things will be far more transparent. Um, you know, and look, they're the sort of things that I advocated for, that my team advocated for, the things that we felt were really good measures to actually make transparency so the public understood. Um, you know, and, and to make sure that the public also understood that this is not permanent, that they will be revoked. Because, and, and I come back to the state of emergency. State of emergency powers were first written up in Victoria in 1958, okay? 
And yeah, that, they were a hundred different names. They've had other iterations since then. And the whole idea of it was to deal with an emergency situation such as fire or flood. And once those emergencies have passed, those orders are rescinded. And this will now operate in exactly the same way. It's not permanent. When all the medical advice points to the fact that the, the pandemic is in decline and is no longer a pandemic, then these orders will be rescinded. Okay, thank you for that. I'm sure that's helped a lot of people out there and, you know, it was very clear. Um, just on, you know, um, changing gears and, and what are your future plans for your political career and what do you still want to achieve? I mean, you had such a long list yesterday of everything that you've done and I don't think, I, I, you know, there's there's been, you know, in the history of Victoria, probably anyone that's done that for animals in, in a parliament. So it, it's a huge achievement. Um, what's next for Andy Medic? Well, look, it's it's a sad fact that um, no matter how many wins you get um, for non-human animals and no matter how many laws you change, no matter how many industries you shut down, there is always another one and another one and another one and another one. This is an ongoing thing and it will be that, that way until I'm long in the grave and, and, and I suspect others as well. Um, so I, I think the key driver for me is that I do want to get re-elected. I think I've got more to give. There's things I want to get done. I want to bring about the ban on 1080 poison in Victoria. You know, I want to see dingoes re re return to their natural habitat to be that controller of the environment, to get rid of, you know, so-called invasive species. I, I call them introduced species. To bring that balance back to wildlife, I've got a really, you know, high end greyhound racing, I want to get jumps racing. Yay, South Australia, let me just say. Right, um, and I, I, I really want to get those things done. Um, but it goes way beyond that. I mean, the list just goes on. Let's get rid of factory farming. Let's get rid, rid of, you know, maceration of chicks. You know, let, 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 I could go on forever. But the underpinning of that, what, what really underpins that and why I want to be get re-elected next year is that I want to be able to assist others to get re -elect, to get elected into the parliament as well, not just in Victoria, but but for, for Mark and Emma in New South Wales to get re-elected and more, you know, I, I want to come back to the parliament at the end of next year with um, the, the person sat there in a the purple jumper, you know, um, you know, as, as another member of parliament, you know, and, and others too, hopefully, you know, so we don't just have members in the upper house, but the lower house too. And I want to see Louise get elected in South Australia. I want to see others get elected in South Australia. I want to see Queenslanders. I want to see West Australians. I want to see Tasmanians. I want to see this party grow and have people in Parliament because, as I said before, the more voices we have, the stronger our position is to change all of these things. And I hope that that's the message that people will take out of all of this and remember that, that without us, they don't have that voice and none of yeah. these things will change. And I want to be there to help those other people get elected and, and to push that along too. And let me just say... If a young person is considering entering politics, don't hesitate, jump. Because the last thing that any House of Parliament needs is more middle-aged white blokes like me. What we need is young women, people of colour, Indigenous representatives, you name it. What we need is parliament houses made up of such diverse populations because that is the population of Australia. We are not a colonial country anymore. Not that we ever were, but that position and, and how it relates to modern society has to change. Our houses of parliament have to represent the diversity of our population. And because without that, then those views can't be represented and someone will always be discriminated against. Yeah, that is amazing. and thank you for like you're kind of like creating a vision of the whole of Australia, and it's literally what I think about all day long, every day. Vegans in politics, vegans in leadership, and coming together. And the stronger we build this, and the more vegans are in parliaments everywhere in the world. Like I'm like global as well, focused. Like the more vegans are everywhere, it's a stronger position for those in there to negotiate and get things done. And it's just we do yeah we need, need to band together and 
and help each other in supporting in all different ways. So thank you so much, Andy, for, for that, for, for bringing that vision out. And I think we're speaking to Adelaide, we're speaking to people online, but you know, these things get recorded and it's, it's also, it, it's, it goes out into the ether and, and it's just a beautiful vision to have. And um, I'll now move on to Georgie and ask her a couple of things. So Georgie, thank you so much for being here. Um, you are a busy, busy person with all the things that you do. And I'm in awe of, of your leadership. Um, what drew you to politics and what was the appeal for you to go in this direction? Because you could go in so many directions as a talented person, honestly. Thanks, Kathy. Um, so what drew me to politics was, I guess, um, much like many people that are in politics, I grew up in a family that was just, political from when I was a kid and my parents always spoke to me about what was going on in federal politics and state politics. I had an auntie who I really looked up to who was working for Julia Gillard when she was Prime Minister. Um, so it was just the world around me. Um, and at the same time, I was young and I was vegetarian and I was very passionate about animals. And I guess as I got older, I saw the link between uh, there was all this amazing work going on for animals. Uh, there was protesting and campaigning and education and litigation, but there was never really that transfer at a political level and there wasn't anyone in parliament that was focusing solely on animals. Um, so I was very much an activist and, and still am. I was going along to a lot of protests. Um, I went to live export protests and I went off to a... Uh, jumps racing protests in Victoria and I saw a uh, horse die in front of me and I realised that, you know, the best way to bring about this change was actually to, to change the law to, to end jumps racing. Sadly, that was 12 years ago and we still have not done it here in Victoria. Um, but I came across the Animal Justice Party in 2012 um, and I decided to join. I was one of the first 50 members and it's just absolutely taken off. We've got thousands of members around the whole country and we've got three members of parliament. We've got two councillors. So I guess, um, yeah, it was that natural sort of uh, growing up around it that drew me into it and then seeing the link into how we can change animals' lives through it. And then um, I was working off in the union movement and in, in superannuation and I got a call one day saying, how much do you like your job? Um, and I got asked to work for Andy and then the rest was history. So, <laughs> yeah. That's, it's amazing. And I've actually got the same background with my dad being in politics. And, you know, as kids we were in campaigns in the backyard and people like the Premier would drop over in New South Wales and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, wow, it's an interesting background. And, you know, the way I've done it is just writing a book and probably just doing an online program. But, yeah, everybody goes into it in different ways. But had a very similar background there. So interesting. Um, next question is like, what does your political life in the future look like? And what do you want to achieve personally? I think we got a hint from Andy just. To, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess my biggest um, priority right now is keeping our existing MP in the parliament. Um, obviously, anyone who went to Andy's talk yesterday would have seen the very, very long list of all the things we've been able to achieve for animals in Parliament. And I think um, that, you know, the value of us being in there just can't be questioned. A little while ago, uh, I think people often underestimated the Animal Justice Party and the power we could have. We've been, been able to show our value now. So my goal is to keep the Animal Justice Party in Parliament and to keep Andy in Parliament. I want to see more than one MP, as, as Andy has said. Um, and yes, I am considering running, as many people <laughs> often ask me, but there will be a process to go through when we have those pre-selections and, and things like that. But um, I just really want, it would be such a loss for us to not be in there next time around. Um, it would be incredibly disappointing because we know that there's just no one who's going to prioritise animals. And as good as our relationship is with the government, um, they're not going to keep doing the animal-friendly policies in the way that they do when we're in there. So. Um, I want to keep the Animal Justice Party in Parliament and that, of course, means, you know, mobilising a bunch of people and building a big movement and campaign around the people that are running. So that will be the priority for the next year and I'm sure um, Andy and our team and everyone else is very much turning our minds to what we do to make sure that people believe in us over the next year to get us back in there. 
Yeah, yeah, amazing. Um, last question for you is, what is the best way for someone to make an impact um, when they don't know where to start? Like, what's your ideas on that one? Yeah, so I, my, if you want to get involved in, um, I guess, the political level of animal protection is, um, I would absolutely say join a political party. Obviously, if you want to focus um, directly on uh, animal animal protection, the Animal Justice Party would be a great party to join. Um, we really welcome it when people want to come along and make a difference. We have a bunch of groups that you can get involved in. Um, our MP and our candidates always need help. Um, they don't get elected you know, on their own. There's a whole movement of people behind them, as, as we said. Um, and I would say join a party, go along to a meeting. We have meetings all around the country um, in every single state um, and find out what you can do to, to play a part. Everyone's got a, such a big range of skills in the animal protection movement and that's what makes us so powerful and so effective. Um, the other thing I would say is getting involved in, um, in campaigns with NGOs that are trying to change the law because that's one of our biggest um, that's one of our sort of biggest stakeholder relationships in the parliament is actually working with the organisations who have been trying to make change for years but never had that person in parliament that would tell their story and represent them. So as Andy said, um, as the president of Oscars Law, it was only when we finally found MPs that would listen to what we wanted um, that we were able to bring about that change. So um, those one would be my two bits of advice for anyone who wants to get involved and isn't sure how. And, of course, my inbox is always open for anyone that sort of wants tips or advice on what they can do. Yeah, the same. And, you know, as young, as Andy said about you know, getting young people involved and, and inspired to, to follow in Andy and your footsteps is, is amazing. And if you're, you know, if they reach out to you and have a conversation, I think that would be super helpful for them. Yeah. Um, I'm going to pass over to Christy with Louise over there and keep, keep going. <laughs> okay, so um, that was awesome, um, Kathy. That was brilliant. And so now we're going to move on to Louise. And um, see, I met you for the first time um, earlier this year, of course, at the Vegan Film Festival. Um, and I could tell from the moment we sat down and started talking that you are you're a change maker and, and you are going to do amazing things. I'd love to know what drew you to politics and would you like to uh, discuss like why you chose the Animal Justice Party? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, unlike uh, some of the others who have spoken, my family was not into politics. It never got spoken about at the dinner table. It was uh, yeah, something that I was had zero interest in until uh, about four, four or five years ago. Uh, my husband has always been really into politics, so he'd always, he'd always talk to me, watch Insiders, that stuff, and I'd just go, yeah, whatever. Um, but it was when it dawned on me a few years ago uh, that the live export trade was still up and running, and I'm like, but I went to a rally in, in 2011 in, in Spring Street, Melbourne, and there were thousands and thousands of people. It's very clear that people were against this, yet the laws hadn't changed. And I got, I was really upset, and um, that's when my husband explained it to me, you know, let me explain to you how politics works. And, and he taught me about how unless you've got, you know, the political will to change something, unless you've got the numbers in parliament to change the laws that are going to help animals, then they're not going to change. It, it, it's not a priority. There are vested interests. There's lots of things at play. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, maybe that's something that I should get involved in then. So my background's actually financial services, uh, management consulting, I'm a retired financial advisor as well. Um, and I thought, well, maybe I can help a political party that's got you know, doing work in this space for animals, focus there. And I was also very concerned about climate change. We had two little children um, and I thought, well, you know, what's going on with animal agriculture? Which parties are addressing this? So uh, the v it was actually at the Vegan Festival in 2017. So what's that, four years ago exactly, that I went to the political parties that were here and I spoke to them, um, asked them specific questions around animal agriculture's impact on the environment, what are their policies, and um, I was really surprised to learn that that actually wasn't a focus for the Greens at all. Uh, whereas the Animal Justice Party, which is the party I ended up joining that day, had very clear policies on recognising all of the causes of climate change, um, in particular uh, methane, um, as well as all of you know the fossil fuels, etc. And uh, so I joined the Animal Justice Party because all of their policies were the things that I wanted to see um, change in the in the, in the in the legal system. Uh, and so I joined, I put my hand up, I said, how can I help? I've got marketing skills, I've got business skills, what can I do? And I just volunteered. 
started volunteering and then after a few months, they're like, would you like to run as a lower house candidate in the state election in 2018 here in South Australia? And I'm like, no, not really. I'm a bit nervous. You know, what will people think? You know, everyone's got a very negative perception, I think, of politicians and candidates and things like that. And, you know, you kind of want to do your thing and not put yourself out there. And uh, But I, you know, sort of said, well, if I'm not going to speak up for animals, if we can't do this and who will and I thought okay I can I can do this I did have a bit of experience a little bit of experience in public speaking etc so I ran as a lower house candidate um, in the seat of Kabul up in the Adelaide Hills um, and that uh, yeah, was very nervous but it gave, provided opportunities so the local newspapers contacted all the candidates who were running I was provided an opportunity to write about animal issues in the local paper every week leading up to the election, which was really great to be able to talk about anything. Kathy mentioned it before, jumps racing, greyhound racing, live export. I could write about anything. And then they asked me to stay on and keep writing for that paper after the election. So it provided a platform for me to talk about animal issues. Uh, move forward to the federal election 2019. I was pre-selected as the lead candidate to run for the uh, Senate. And I've also now been pre-selected to run again as the lead candidate for the upcoming state and federal elections. So the Animal Justice Party is where it's at. Like if we really want to see change for these really important issues around pandemic prevention, factory farming, climate change, all of those things, then the Animal Justice Party is, is where it's at. Yep. I mean, that makes perfect sense from a, a vegan perspective. Um, so what are some of the wins that have been experienced here in South Australia? I can think of, of one particular one quite recently. But likewise, what are some of the challenges that animals are still facing here? Yes, so everyone would have heard about how jumps racing has been taken off the calendar for next year. That was such a thrill to see that. It was one of the issues we campaigned on at the last state election. There are animal activists here, um, Coalition Against uh, Race Horses, uh, Animal Lib, that have been campaigning against jumps racing for years and years and years. The numbers have been dropping. It's no longer a viable race. So it's no longer going to be on the calendar here, which is such a win. Um, all those injuries and deaths avoided. Obviously, we've got flats racing, but it's, it's a step in the right direction. So that's a really big win. Uh, in terms of the challenges animals face, oh, my gosh, I mean, duck shooting is still legal here. Most people don't realise, you know, a couple of thousand duck shooters go out every year with a licence and shoot these native uh, animals. Like, in, you know, they're just peacefully going about their business in wetlands and estuaries and wherever. And um, they get shot out of the sky. They get wounded. Uh, about 60,000 every year here in South Australia, and about half of them are, are wounded. Um, so they don't, it's not a clean kill. So they might have their beak smashed, or they might, you know, have some shotgun pellets that just injure them. They might um, have internal damage. They will, you know, die a slow death over the coming days or weeks. It's just awful. I just cannot believe that this barbaric activity is, is still allowed here in South Australia. And again, this is one of the things that we need to get in and get the numbers. There are some sympathetic MPs in Parliament here in South Australia, but there's not enough yep so that's just one challenge there's lots of others greyhound racing um you know the supporting of the factory farming industry in murray bridge um what else obviously live exports ships slip there, there is such an endless endless list yep it really does seem endless and you know the duck shooting question that's something that we face in tasmania on a massive scale um and even though the greens are on side with banning duck shooting we don't have animal specific candidates actually in parliament who can affect change with the, the majority parties. And I'm not sure how many Liberals and Labor um, MPs are actually that sympathetic towards ducks. And so it's, it's really, really difficult and a massive challenge just like you're facing here. Um, so could you tell us about some of the campaign work you're currently working on and, and what's, what's your vision for your future? What do you want to achieve? So uh, current campaigns, uh, we, uh, by virtue of me running in the state election in 2018 in the seat of Kabul, through some preference negotiations, we were promised that there would be an inquiry into bow and crossbow hunting, which most people would be very surprised to learn is actually still legal here. Under certain conditions, it's, uh, there's lots of loopholes uh, that people can still go out with a, a, a a bow, like an actual bow and crossbow and kill animals. Again, it's got the same issue as what duck shooting has, inev high inevitable wounding rates. It's a very cruel activity. So that inquiry took place uh, finally earlier this year, about three years after it was promised. And uh, we wrote a submission for the Animal Justice Party of which I was leading the branch here up until just recently. Uh, and so we got to go and present some evidence in Parliament House to the inquiry. So we're ready, waiting to see the results of that and we're hopeful for um, an outcome that will see this, this sport completely banned. 
The other, the other campaign we're working on at the moment, uh, aside from some general advocacy, we did a couple of weeks ago around kangaroos and kangaroo killing, which is actually a huge issue here in South Australia. So half a million, there's a quota, a legal quota for kangaroo killers to go and kill up to 500,000 kangaroos in South Australia every year. Last year, they got to 100,000. I mean, the numbers are just staggering. Uh, but the fact that they only you know, got to kill a hundred only a hundred thousand speaks volumes as to where where are where are these kangaroos? You know, there's big question marks over the population numbers and things like that. But the biggest campaign we're working on right now is the election campaign. The state election is in March. It's supposed to be on March the 19th. The federal election can be any time from December until May next year. We're gonna we are working our hardest, <laughs> pulling together the campaign team, pulling together our members, forming teams, volunteer teams, finding more candidates, all of those things. It is a huge logistical and strategic effort because that is the very biggest campaign right now because uh, as lead candidate, if we can uh, get enough votes, first preference votes and some good preference negotiations, really good chance of seeing uh, myself elected to the Legislative Council here in South Australia. And what a difference that will make for animals, at, just as we've seen in South Wales and with Andy in Victoria. And I think I, I'm glad that you're with AJP, but I think that any party that you chose to be with, you would actually affect so much change there because you're just that sort of person. You know, you, you're going to do really well. And so if you've got any skill sets that you can help out with the campaign, get on board. Now get Louise in there because you know, she's she's a game changer. Thank you so much. So back over to you, Kathy. I think. Yep, I think so. Um, thank you, Louise. Um, all the very best with the election, and if you know if we can help from interstate, let us know because, as um, Christy said, it, you know you're you're the candidate that you know has ethical leadership top of mind. You've had the animals in in you know the best interest for animals and you've already proven yourself to be a great candidate so I really really sincerely wish you all the best um, and we might throw it to if there's anyone in the audience that wants to have a question or a comment or for any of the panelists um, I, I don't know how if how it works online if there's any chat allowed or whatever but is there anyone out there that wants to ask something ask your future senator a question Howdy. Um, I was just going to ask, do you feel like your cause is best served in what might be perceived as like a niche party um, as opposed to like trying to rise through into a major and try to sway a major further towards these issues? That's a, a question that we get. Hello? Yes, it is. Okay, so that's a question that we get asked often. I guess what... Um, so just by way of background, the Animal Justice Party was started up by uh, ex-Greens members who were uh, frustrated by the lack of focus on animal issues once Greens MPs were elected. Because uh, the other parties, uh, they lose their focus quite quickly with, without having, uh, you know, very specific animal policies and keeping that front of mind in their decision making. Uh, but the, the, the fact is, is right now the Animal Justice Party, our relevance is never more um, poignant and keen than it is because it's a very... The health of our pe of people and animals and the planet is so inextricably linked, and we are the only party that's drawing that link between the health of animals, people, and planet. And so that's why we need to be in there to make sure that the focus stays very clear and focused, not just on animals, but on the other really big issues that are threatening all, all living systems. Could I um could I just add something onto that? I think it might be useful to I guess explain the context in Victoria. Um, in uh, in every single party in uh, the parliament in Victoria, there are vegans, there are vegetarians, there are activists. Um, honestly, I'd go as far to say that maybe up to a third of the Labor caucus here in Victoria is vegan or vegetarian, and many of them care about animals, and they're trying to change it from the inside, but it's really, really hard work. And the issue is, if you're in a major party, you can't uh, you can't sway away from what their policy is. So every year when the duck shooting season comes around, um, there's MPs in the Labor caucus who are furious that the government's called a season, but there's not much they can do about it and they can't really call it out in a big way. The way that it works for us is when we get in the upper house, um, especially when the government doesn't have a majority, which they don't, the government relies on the crossbench to pass any piece of legislation. They can't do it without us. So while we don't do deals, it's not the way that it works in the state parliament. 
it allows us to create these really good relationships and to um, we have regular meetings with ministers, regular meetings with MPs, and when they talk to us about the things that they need to get done, we get to talk to them about things that we need to get done. Whereas if we were in a major party trying to do this work, you just don't have that power because they're not relying on you. They know how you're going to vote because you have to vote that way. Um, so by having these um, animal-specific MPs with um, this really, you know, immense power to pass any piece of government legislation, it gives us a lot stronger sounding board to actually tell them what we want for animals. And with the Labor members um, in Victorian Parliament, does it, do they have to, they have to vote with the government, don't they? That's, it's yeah, just, the Labor Party, that's what. Yeah. Uh, they're not allowed to cross the floor in Victoria. Um, so, you know, if there's policy that they don't agree with, um, there's not much that they can do about it, which is what happens when you're in a major party, whereas Andy obviously doesn't have that issue. Yeah. <laughs> As an example of that, and the, the last time it happened, so Labor are very strict on this rule. Um, that happened from uh, the member for Geelong at the time, his name was Rod McKenzie, he was a Labor member for Geelong. Um, in 1984, he crossed the floor and was subsequently expelled from the party. Um, and Rod McKenzie was actually the man who wrote the Proctor legislation in Victoria. Um, you know, the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act, and which was a significant piece of legislation, yet it didn't stop him from being expelled from the Labor Party. Yeah, yeah. So if, if you're a vegan and you want to get things done, um, you would suggest joining a party that's animal specific for getting things done instead of the Labor Party members that are, that are vegan and obviously very frustrated in, in the wrong party, I, I guess. So, um, is there any other questions in the in the audience? No. Come on, guys, throw them at us. Don't be shy. <laughs> I've got a I've got a long list I can ask, but you know, it, it's always people people are writing on social media a lot of comments. Here's your chance to to ask them, and and to get clarity on anything, you know. It, it's 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 the best way is to talk mm. you know and you're talking about collaborative politics it's just good to sit down together and talk about these things and clear things up that that, that you know and, and, and sometimes you know we're, we're as um andy was saying yes they were all people and yeah i don't know andy do you want to talk a bit about collaborative politics and, and your content because i'm really uh, it, it's really interesting to and Georgie just spoke a little bit about just now about sitting down with mps and things like that and, and finding common ground and I had no yeah. idea there were so many vegans in the Labor Party in Victoria. I mean, that's that's amazing. Um, well, well that, 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 what Georgie spoke about there is absolutely 100% correct. And, and because the, the barrier for that particular MP, that particular government MP, is that they can't bring that issue to the fore. They can talk about it within caucus, but they won't get the traction. So by having that relationship with them, it opens that door for them to get, even if it's an animal issue that they want to get done, we can get it done for them because mm -hmm. the government will listen to us on that particular issue, whereas they won't necessarily listen to their own MP on it. So mm -hmm. you know, it, it opens that door. And, and that's one of the ways that that, that, that happens. Um, but it's also about, you know, you, you're right. You get to sit down with them. You get to find out who they are as human beings and vice versa. You know, it, 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 it facilitates friendships and, and it facilitates, you know, very open relationships, open dialogue about what, about what you want to get done, you know. And look, there are also some decent people on the opposite side of the political chamber as well. But likewise, they are held back by a very, very uh, iron hand um, that, that stops them from, from speaking in the way that they want to. It's really when they get to the end of their careers and the opposition that they start to actually speak out about things that are important to them. And there's, there's, there's one in our chamber particularly um, who is uh, you know, prone to just standing there and going against exactly everything that his party wants him to say. Um, and, and it's quite refreshing actually to find out that this, this, this man has these other views, you know, that, that don't necessarily reside where their their policy set is, um, and and that's it, it's so important to know that because it then also means that you know we can perhaps seek broad support across the chamber for things that we want to get done. Um, you know, when we looked for support for um, pound and shelter reform, you know, when, when we brought that to the parliament, that motion, it was massively important to be able to 
to talk with all sides of politics and to find out the things that were important to them in that and also find out they supported what we were trying to do. And we ended up passing that motion unanimously. And you know, there was there was nothing, no one holding back, which was fantastic to see. And that doesn't happen in our chamber very often. There's a reason that they call our chamber the snake pit. Right? It's not um, not a great place. The, 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 the insults that get hurled backwards and forwards are often actually quite horrible um, and of quite a personal nature. Yeah. Um, and, and politics shouldn't be like that. You know, it shouldn't be like kids in a playground. It, it should not be that way. That's what I want to, in my vision and work, is like what people are put off going into politics because they're like, yeah, but everyone's so mean to each other in there, and especially like people like me. I'm an introvert and like highly sensitive to people. It's like how they, I tell people you should be a leader. They're like, how could I handle all those mean people in parliament? It's like, well, we need to change the culture in parliament. That, that's exactly right. That's it's exactly right. Go in, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, think, I think it's just going to be the tough guys in there all the time and nothing will change. I and think that's, that's why I talk about, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to jump in and say, look, I think, um, yeah, absolutely, the culture in Parliament needs to be changed. Everyone has seen some pretty nasty stuff happening over the years, particularly this year, uh, over a range of issues. But uh, I think that um, for anyone aspiring candidates, it's about being really clear on what your purpose is. That is what keeps me going. I'm very aware that if I get elected, I'm going to be subjected to, you know, like, you know, insults or offensive behaviour or whatever it might be. But for me, like my my stakeholders um, is not just the environment and, and, and people, as I mentioned, but animals. Like there is just so much at stake. I don't care what the trolls may or may not say. I don't care. I have to be really, really focused. And so be really clear on your purpose. Um, but just for anyone that is, you know, even considering it, you know, just take the first step. You know, you can you can learn on the go. Like if you are clear that your purpose is, okay, I want to try and help a party get elected or help um, maybe run as a candidate myself or whatever it might be, please put up your hand. It's so important to see structural change for animals and to see laws change. And this is the way to do it. Yep. And, and how, do, how do the, you know, people in parliament, what is like, because people, if people knew that there was like frameworks for self-care and that kind of thing, how do you guys live like after a heavy day you know in the public scrutiny what what are your routines and what is your strategy if you have one or what's your support network or how do you do it i think that's helpful for people to know the behind the scenes a little bit George, um, well look, i can only speak for me um my team are incredibly supportive um incredibly supportive um i, I lean on them a lot um, um probably more so than I, 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 I would or should in any other um, situation, you know, in any other workplace. But it is a unique workplace um, in, in that respect. It's such high pressure um, because you know what's at stake. Um, it, it's very easy to, to be in there and think that what you're doing at that moment in time is just a piece of legislation. It's just words on a page. It just does this or it does that and it doesn't affect people's lives or animals' lives very easy to be caught in that particular moment. And you must not do that. You must look at it and go, this is something that is going to change people's lives and animals' lives out there in the real world. It's going to put the course of history gun going in this direction to this direction. Um, and that is why it's so massively important to, to make sure that you're in the right frame of mind to be able to get that done. And you can't do that unless you have the opportunity to vent when things do get too much. Um, and there is a like there is a professional support network that the parliament offers as well, which is known as CAFI. Um, I'm not sure what that actually stands for, but um, it, it is a, um, a system of counsellors, et cetera. Um, and, and that's available to not just all members of parliament, that's available to all staff. Um, and it is there. Um, but yeah, look, and the other thing is, well, for me, I don't sleep much. <laughs> I, um, I think my bit of advice would be on, on how to deal with that is um, I'm probably the ultimate hypocrite because I'm always very busy, but I make sure that I always, um, I, I think it's really important to have a life outside of politics and to have something else that you, you do that's not political. So. Um, I go, um, I have friends that I go, that I make sure I go roller skating with once a week. I do a boxing class. 
I um, I have animals here on my property. I go and spend time with them um, without my phone. It's sort of one of the things that's most important to me to spend time with animals, not only because it helps me switch off, but it's also a really good reminder about what, what we're doing there. And no matter how difficult things get, it's, you know, it's about the animals and it's about bringing change about for them. Um, the other thing that we have in our parliament that we're very lucky to have is we've got um, a really good cross-party support network. So there's a bunch of MPs and staff that we're friendly with that, you know, we'll often, you know, get dinner with or something after work um, where you can sort of just have that debrief because everyone's going through the same thing, particularly right now. So um, as difficult as parliament can be and as um, awful and as harsh as politics can be sometimes, there's a really nice, bright, supportive side of it that I think a lot of people don't actually see. So uh, I think if anyone's scared of getting involved um, in politics because I'm an introvert as well, Cathy, a lot of people find I'm the extroverted introvert. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I struggle with it as well and um, and it's been a real, really big learning curve. But um, as much as there's awfulness in politics, there's actually really nice and beautiful support in there as well and I wouldn't let, um, I wouldn't let the fear of, um, criticism to put anyone off. Yeah, that's such an amazing and important message because I don't think people know what on earth is going on behind the scenes. And by, you know, you're coming on here and you're telling people actually, you know, on behind the scenes that there's this, there's this support staff and we actually even cross party, sit down with each other and, and, and have these um, common ground. It's just, I think, because I, I do want to encourage more people into politics, it's just really helpful to to have a little bit of this um these snippets of, of what of what actually happens and it's not just all on social media with the post and it you know there's there's lives going on behind and and yeah yeah just really appreciate those messages did uh louise did you want to say something uh, we've got like i think eight minutes left um to your local um people there is there any more questions in the audience there at all uh, yeah, there's another question here. Patty, this one? Yes? Okay. Sorry if you want another question. Um, what does participation in the party look like for people who join the Animal Justice Party if you're not like a figurehead? You know, what can you do as a volunteer in the background? There are, um, because we're coming into election time, there's a lot of roles that we need filled uh, from a logistical perspective in terms of people willing to uh, rally the troops for the candidate that's running in their area, for example. So we've got uh, regional group participation. So we've divided up South Australian AJP members into different groups based on federal electorate. So there's the opportunity to go and meet up with your local members, talk about uh, AJP members, talk about ways to support the candidate that will be running. So that's probably the most practical thing right now. But then, then when, when it gets a bit closer to elections, there are so many jobs, you know, whether it's delivering how to vote cards to volunteers, um, helping booths get uh, volunteers equipped to, you know, stand on booths and hand out how to vote cards. Um, there's, they're, they're the main thing. So there's a lot of, you know, that kind of volunteering that that's required. Uh, we do have some other more niche roles in the background. So it really depends on someone's skill set. There's no shortage of ways to get involved. We can have a chat after if you like. <laughs> Any other questions? Nope. Um, so Kathy, you asked if there was anything else I wanted to say. I, it's really great that everyone came here today and for everyone watching online and to hear about the work that Andy's doing and, and Georgie's doing and, um, you know, in part to promote the Animal Justice Party, but also in part to promote the idea of ethical leadership, but also how important politics is to our movement. Like I, like I said, I was an anti-politician, anti-politics, everything. Now I think it is such a critical part of the world that we need to, to move towards. So um, if you haven't already, come to the Animal Justice Party store. We've got some more information about um, what our MPs have achieved. Um, Andy's touched on some things here, but we've got some more information there. And uh, you can sign up as a member um, and, and I'll be over there as well. So come and have a chat. But yeah, please support the Animal Justice Party in the upcoming state and election uh, campaigns. Thank you, Louise. And I really um, sincerely wish you all the best with your campaign. Um, and do you want to have a final say anything? Final thoughts? Georgie, you go first. Sure. Um, I guess, uh, as Andy said um, earlier on, something I really wanted to reiterate is as a young person in politics, 
Um, I'm 29 um, and obviously um, mentioned have potential political ambitions. Um, I would really encourage anyone who is, um, you know, might think that they're too young or there's something about their life that could be putting them off to, to give it a go. Um, we need people, we need people in politics representing animals, obviously, but we need um, good diversity of people representing animals and, and telling their stories as well. So um, if anyone is interested in joining the Animal Justice Party, we are absolutely welcoming of anyone who would like to join. Um, and I'm actually just a little bit of self-promo, speaking of politics, talking at 4.15 about the Puppy Farm campaign, which is obviously another state uh, politics issue and something that we can potentially ban in South Australia. Um, next year with an election coming. So I'll be talking about how that can be done at 4.15 today if people want um, an NGO perspective. I'll be speaking on behalf of Oscar's Law about how we can get that done. Oh, is it me now? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, look, I just think, just as a last thing to reiterate what both Louise and Georgie have said, and 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 particularly to to harp on about um, having having younger people in politics, because um, we talked earlier about you know the culture of what exists in the parliaments. The Victorian Parliament is no different to the South Australian Parliament, the West Australian Parliament, to federal politics. The behaviour is so terrible because factional politics and the ages of the people have just they've just made that you know part of the system younger people need to come through and change the system you know I, I look at the climate rallies that took place you know last year um, with all those young people that were motivated and wanted to change the world you know it is all the rallies in the world won't change the views of the people who are in the political system if they don't want to change it if there's no interest in them changing it right? Young people want to see change, join political parties, get elected, make that change because suddenly those chambers are not full of old men with links to the coal industry or links to here or there. They're full of people who want to see change and want to treat each other differently and want to see a different world. And that's exactly what we need. I can I could die a happy man if I saw a parliament, every parliament in this country full of people who are, you know, 28 to 35 years old making the changes that I want to see for them. So that, and I guess that's my final message. Thank you. That is a beautiful vision. I could, you know, we're just talking about the diversity. So important. I mean, Australia is a diverse nation and it needs to the parliament does need to reflect that. So um Yes, and you, you know, you, we're on it. We're well on our way with with representatives, vegan representatives in Australia so far. Um, I think we're probably going to get cut off, so I'll do my final statement. Um, thank you to everyone who has joined us today. I hope you leave here inspired to make your own positive mark on the world, or continue with more energy for the great work that you're already doing. Um, I mentioned earlier, if you're interested in the ethical leadership program I'm developing, please reach out to me. And let's connect and continue this conversation on social media. For, every, for anyone interested in Golden Age politics, it's available from all major online bookstores. And enjoy the rest of your festival. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you to Kathy Devine, Georgie Purcell, Louise Pfeiffer, Andy Medic, and Christy Elgar for our panel today. Um, Thank you all for coming. Our next session uh, starts at one o'clock. We have Simon Tui and Mandy Hall, both ex uh, MasterChef contestants, who will be up here cooking us a beautiful meal. So come back uh, at one and grab a seat. We'll see you then.